hear me okay? Good, excellent, okay. So who am I? I'm Richard Harmon. I've been doing InfoSec for about 10 years. I'm currently one of the intrusion analysts at SRA International's Incident Response Center. I've been doing it for about 10 years. Uh, primarily I do malware analysis, Perl scripting, and uh, just all around sysadmin and foo. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me, here's my Twitter, my email address, and my GitHub account where I've got all kinds of crazy code. But overall, generally, I'm a hacker. Um, this is me working on an Arduino, like, in-circuit programmer that I got from China. It was like four bucks. Um, and I wouldn't be quite such the awesome hacker if it weren't for these two organizations, Nova Hackers and Nova Labs. I'm actually on the board of both of these organizations. Now, if there's anybody from either of these organizations in the audience, please stand up. All right, thank you. So these organizations are awesome because they promote you to be better at speaking, doing more awesome hacks and stuff. So those people that stand up, um, ask them, how do I join? And they'll help you join either one of those organizations. <laughs> Um, there's also a, uh, a women's focus group uh, starting up at uh, Nova Labs and Nova Hackers, uh, led by Stacy and Sarah. Somewhere in there? Okay, maybe not. But uh, so if you're uh, trying to get into IT or hacking or stuff and you're kind of like afraid to, like go see them and they'll help you out. So why are we here? We're here for hacking on USB thumb drives. So uh, to give you a point of reference on why I got started, uh, it's because I heard about this virus going around on Twitter and on like Google Plus, you know, something that was kind of crazy, could do amazing things, like some pretty wild things. I mean, I, it was just impressive, the stuff that this stuff was supposed to do. I mean, it was like this seven-headed Hydra virus that was being written by some dude in his basement on like these crazy computers, all right? So now this is the audience participation point. So this was the really scary part. All right, so say it with me. You probably know what I'm talking about now on the count of three, one, two, three, bad BIOS. All right, thank you, yes. So what were the features of bad BIOS? Okay, so we heard it could spread via USB flash drives. We heard it could infect the flash drives somehow. We heard it could infect the host firmware, you know, like the BIOS, the keyboard controller, etc. We heard it was cross-platform between different motherboards, different USB controllers, etc. cetera. Um, and then it was somehow like cross-platform to different BIOSes, like, EFI BIOS, UEFI BIOS, the regular uh, legacy BIOS, and it was cross operating system, BSD, Mac, Windows, etc. cetera. Uh, and it also somehow had IPv6 networking, like it would do that for command and control. And then the coup de gras on all of this was it would do audio based networking through like your laptop's microphone and speaker to bridge air gaps, you know, in case you unplugged everything. And to all of that, I say, wait, what? <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe you could do it once on like one particular system that you're targeting and you would know the hardware in and out more than like the original developers did. But I mean, to do that where you can go between a whole bunch of different systems that someone owns time and time again and keep your infection present, I think is kind of difficult. So just forget all that. I don't care about bad BIOS. I don't want to hear anything about it. I don't want to hear anything about leaks that have come out recently. I haven't read any of them. But so I'm here to talk about USB flash drives and USB mass storage. So I'm going to go over uh, parts of the hardware. Uh, I'm going to show you some nice hardware porn photos. I love taking hardware apart. Um, I'm going to identify the block level components um, and show you how to identify the flash controllers and what their features are. Um, and then ultimately how you can reprogram them to do cool things for yourself. So mass storage. So I've got a family of hard drives here, a mommy, a daddy, and a little baby. Two three and a half inch hard drives, one quarter, uh, two and a half inch hard drive. Um, and those are pretty standard. You've seen those all over. Um, and we've also got these regular thumb drives that are about the size of your thumb. And then we've got these things that are absolutely freaking tiny. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is USB mass storage has gone from being absolutely massive to absolutely tiny, but conversely, the capacity of these devices has gotten larger and larger and larger. So um, here for some nice photos. So this is a really old USB hard drive where you've got your IDE hard drive, you've got your data ribbon, your power cable, and tucked underneath all of that is your control board that does the USB protocol or IDE protocol. And it's the same basic idea for your SATA hard drives. I mean, you've got your plastic clamshell case, your hard drive, and then your control board that does your data and power. And then flash drives. I mean, they've got basically their memory chips for storing the actual data, and then they've got the controller. Um, this drive actually happens to be USB 3. You can kind of tell by uh, there's extra pins on the USB connector instead of just four. But so on the USB hard drive components here, uh, so here's your host interface where your USB cable comes in. You've got your power for making the power nice to the 
hard drive and the rest of it. Then you've got your USB data pins. Now, USB pins, uh, uh, they're differential signaling, so that's why there's two separate wires, so you can have better signal fidelity. Uh, those go to the uh, bridge or controller chip. In this case, it's a bridge. And then coming out of the bridge chip, you've got your SATA pins. Now, these are also differential signaling. It's two pair of them. And then ultimately down to your host device, your hard drive, CD-ROM, whatever. Now, I said uh, bridge and controller here. The reason why is because there's a difference between a hard drive USB enclosure controller versus a flash drive controller. Under the hood, they're actually kind of similar, but it's the firmware that's running on them. On a USB hard drive controller that's got spinning media or a CD-ROM, it's intentionally generic firmware. You're only going to see the hard drive or CD-ROM drive that's actually physically connected to it. Uh, on a flash controller, um, all it's doing is logically mapping the uh, sector that the computer is asked for to a region in the flash memory on the chip. Um, the, flash pro uh, the controller can be reprogrammed, and the host ultimately sees what the controller wants it to. Now, some of you have probably taken a hard drive out of an enclosure because it wasn't working and troubleshooted it by plugging in your computer directly. Um, and if you've ever done that and it works and it, on the computer, it's because your controller lost its frickin' mind. <laughs> All right? So, <laughs> All right, so on to flash hard, uh, USB flash controller parts. So uh, here's a basic USB thumb drive. And just for size reference, here is actually this drive I took a picture of. So the chip that I have circled here is the flash controller. It's an ASIC. ASIC, in case you're not familiar, stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Um, it does one thing uh, very special and that one thing very well. It's not generic. It can't do a whole bunch of things. Um, and if we flip this guy around, we've got the actual flash memory. Um, and uh, so USB mass storage, uh, like I mentioned before, it's differential voltage signaling. It basically means the voltages go up and down on the different pins. Uh, the speed on them is between 6 megahertz and 2.5 gigahertz. 2.5 gigahertz is the USB 3 super speed uh, end of the line. And uh, all the bridge or controller chip does is it translates the USB protocol to what your hard drive or CD-ROM or whatever happens to be plugged in uh, speaks. Uh, and the reason why is because there's no direct translation from the USB mass storage protocol to what the hard drive talks. You have to have that guy in the middle doing the translation for you. Now, what you probably weren't aware of is USB mass storage is actually SCSI. You know, those, those old, 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 loud 10,000K RPM uh, drives that you have on this chain of, of drives. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a full SCSI command set. It's a subset based on whether you have a hard drive, CD-ROM drive, tape drive, et cetera, plugged in. Um, and these SCSI commands actually ride on top of the USB protocol. Uh, it's encapsulated. Um, and uh, that can sometimes cause trouble. So if you ever used Smart Control or Smart Mon hard drive monitoring software through a USB like dock, sometimes it doesn't work right. Uh, and with this, uh, it's still SCSI. It's still one SCSI target. That means you've got one device, but you can have more than one logical unit. And that's what's called a logical uh, unit number. So I keep going into specifics of the USB protocol, and here's actually what it looks like. Um, with the, the two data lines, where you've got one that's a high voltage and one that's a low voltage. And the reason why is because when you have those two voltages separate from each other like that, the, the device on the other end can say, oh, that was a one or that was a zero. Meanwhile, if you get some interference like EM interference, RF interference, whatever, that affects both of the lines the same, on the other end, you see nothing because it has subtracted that noise out. So why am I going into all this detail for all this USB level protocol stuff? It's because I found this utility that lets me mess with flash drives. Um, this one actually lets you hide parts of your flash drive with a password so that your operating system can't see it. And it works. It was awesome. Uh, but I had no idea how it worked. So I said, I have to figure this out. So I decided I was going to do some sniffing of the USB. So I, uh, I had to figure out what my options were. I could use a logic analyzer. I could use a hardware man in the middle device. Uh, and there's some pros and cons of both. Uh, the logic analyzer generally has too much detail. I mean, it's got exactly what's on the wire, errors included. Uh, and there's no protocol in protocol decoding. All that extra effort that the USB mass storage protocol and the SCSI commands and stuff have on top of USB is just bits and bytes to these logic analyzers. Uh, if you wanted to use a hardware man in the middle device, go see Dominic's talk tomorrow. He's got a 
uh, BeagleBone Blackboard that he's converted into being a USB man in the middle device. But uh, here's what I used. I've got a Sele Logic 8. Uh, it's a USB 2 based logic analyzer and the latest beta software actually supports decoding USB. Uh, and so I'm sniffing a USB thumb drive that's USB 2 as well. And if you're trying to do something at 60 miles an hour and then record exactly everything that's going on at 60 miles an hour or USB 2 speeds, you're going to drop some data. So I actually had to slow down my USB flash drive by plugging it into USB 1 hub. So that way I had faster recording capabilities than my actual device was producing data. So I ended up vampire tapping the lines. I got a USB extension cable and then stripped off the shielding and put in my test taps. And here's what I got. So this was me punching in the password password to that application while a hard drive was locked. And there it is. In plain text, I see my password going across the wire in USB. Hallelujah. I've got, I know how this kind of works, but I don't have any context. I don't know what comes before, what comes after, et cetera. I can't replicate this yet. So I had to switch to high-level sniffing USB. And there's pros and cons of this as well. So you can install a driver in Windows called USB PCAP. It basically ties into Wireshark and makes a network interface that you say, dump this USB interface. Um, and uh, because it's so high level, it's basically tracing the execution of the commands in Windows against that USB device. And in Windows, you just send your commands, and at some point down the line, like, it gets actually sent out the USB uh, connector. And it can be in the same order you ex executed the commands, or it can be in a different order. There's kind of like scheduling that goes on. So that can, can or will miss data. Uh, another option is you can use your virtualization environment, VMware, QMU, VirtualBox, whatever. Uh, almost all of them support in the hypervisor dumping out the vir virtual USB stack. Uh, and Linux under uh, QMU and KVM uh, has got its uh, kernel module called USB Mon, and that does the same thing as USB PCAP, uh, but it's lower level so it actually will get all of the data from the OS. So there's lots of tools to look at these PCAPs that USB Mon creates. Most importantly, Wireshark. Wireshark has the USB protocol decoding, USB mass storage decoding, and that's what it looks like. So in the bottom of the bytes display, now we see the word password that I had from the logic analyzer. And up above, I have the SCSI command where it's uh, SCSI command 0E, uh, logical unit number 1. So now I have a much better understanding of exactly what the command and then the payload in that command was to this drive to unlock. So I was able to successfully uh, re-implement the USB flash drive security software under Linux. So I've got these random bytes here, OE, OO, O1, 55, AA, uh, that will turn off the protection. Uh, and then I've got one for temporarily unlocking it. Uh, and uh, here's actually how to change or set the password under Linux. So this is using a command called sgraw. It just fires SCSI commands at a device. And this is actually basically a 64-byte uh, packet that gets sent. Uh, the first 16 bytes are the old password in case you're changing the password. The next one are the new password. And the last one, the last 32 are a password hint. So uh, you basically uh, like do the same thing I did for any other implementation of this. You sniff the traffic, figure out how it's working, and then re-implement it with sgraw or another application. So that was a little bit of a teaser of the cool things that you can do when you get this sort of sniffing stuff set up. But how do you get there? How do you get that to, the, to that point? Well, you rip apart hardware and you look at the flash controller. So this is the flash controller on this drive here. Um, I actually doctored the photo a little bit so to make it easier to read. That chip says UP21. So I went onto Google and I punched in UP21 flash. And suddenly, bang, all these websites pop up with information about this chip. Um, a lot of them in Chinese or Russian, or uh, there is a couple that are in English language, but a lot of them go through uh, Google Translate very well. Um, and it got to the point where in some of these Chinese websites where I was downloading stuff, I actually knew what the download like characters looked like. Oh, it's that one, not this one that actually says download. That's a, that, that download.com toolbar thing. So, <laughs> so when you're researching these flash drives, you've probably heard of all of these consumer vendors, you know, SanDisk, Kingston Digital, et cetera. You, these are all the v brands that you've seen in your stores. Um, what you've probably not seen is the chips that are on the inside of these. So this is where you get uh, all the OEM flash controller manufacturers that produce chips that are on the inside of those drives. 
Um, you're not supposed to know nor care about what these chips are. It's supposed to be insignificant to you. The drive is just supposed to operate as a flash drive and you're done with it. But going on. So the question is, what manufacturer of the consumer drives uses what chip? So I went through a completely unscientific process of looking at a website that had a database of what chip was inside of what thumb drive, and uh, I found the most common ones along with the drives that I happen to have on hand. So I've got the uh, chip uh, flash control controller vendors on the outside, I've got the consumer vendor on the inside, and little arrows that point to each one, and then a running tally of how many times I've seen that flash controller vendor used. So let's get started. So verbatim uses Fission, uh, Intel uses Fission as well, uh, TDK uses Fission, uh, Lenovo, Alcor, Sony uses Silicon Motion, uh, Corsair uses Silicon Motion, Toshiba uses Solid State System. Uh, oh, hold on, Trend Micro uses three different chips. So up before that, we had a kind of consistent idea. If I go buy this brand of controller, I can now do this brand of flash drive. I can do with these controllers, and it just gets worse. Uh, so A Data uses two, Silicon Power uses four, and. Kingston uses like six. Uh, so Kingston is a name that I associate with quality, but apparently they don't care. They don't care what flash drive controller they're gonna use. So, uh, so I went out to the store and I bought a whole bunch of thumb drives with the intention of tearing these bad boys apart and seeing what was on the inside. Uh, I tried to get as many different ones as possible, different shapes, sizes, features, etc. cetera. Um, and the question again is what's on the inside? So um, this is what they look like when they have their casing uh, removed. Now there's one in the middle that's kind of hard to see on the screen, but it looks like a little black stick. Now we kind of knew what it would look like like that from the previous, go back, so because it's an absolutely tiny thing. But the other ones uh, that are also black sticks, you couldn't tell. So I mean, it was plastic housing around this tiny little black stick. And I had no idea those other two would look that way. But long of the run of it, um, these are the different vendors that are the flash controllers on these drives. So we've got Innistore, SMI, Fission, 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 US Best, SMI, Fission, and Fission. So I'm seeing a running pattern here. Um, Fission is apparently really popular in these drives, uh, at least the drives that I got from Micro Center. There were four different kinds of drives from Fission. Um, and uh, these all pretty much have the same feature set uh, between uh, the Fission chips and then across different manufacturers like InnoStore and Silicon Motion. So just to give you an idea of what these capabilities are, here's this four gig thumb drive that I got at Micro Center for five bucks. So this is a Fission controller. It's the PS225161. This supports multiple LUNs, the multiple virtual drives, hidden LUNs, so now you can hide data, and it also supports password protecting them. Again, for five bucks. This is not something you're supposed to be aware of. Uh, this is a Centeon drive. This one happens to be uh, about a dollar a gig again. Um, this one uses a different chip. Uh, this one is the SMI 3270ENLT and supports the same features as the chip I saw before. And this is one of the drives that I intentionally found something that, something that was supposed to be awesome. So this is the Centeon secure chip. So this is about $2 a gig. But wait, this one uses the same controller as the $5 flash drive I had before. So this drive doesn't support crypto. Um, and what it does have is it actually has a logical unit, another virtual hard drive on there, that's got crypto software for Mac. And I'm a PC guy, so this drive was twice as expensive and useless to me. So which would you buy? Would you buy the $8 uh, drive that is cheap and has all the free software that you, you, you could need, you know, TrueCrypt or PGP to encrypt your data, or would you spend twice as much money on a drive that has no hardware crypto support that just has software on it? Me, I would buy the cheaper one. But the problem is you don't know what you're getting until you take it apart or until you look at it. So uh, just to give you guys a better idea of what those tiny little black sticks were, um, those are called monolithic USB drives. Um, so here's what they look like uh, with uh, part of their epoxy removed. Uh, and these photos came from recovermydrive.com. Um, but uh, this is all in one, one package, the controller and the memory at the same time. Um, and this is what they look like when they're being fabricated. Um, these photos came from Bunny. Uh, if you saw uh, Bunny and Xop's talk at 30C3, go watch it, it's awesome. So this is actually the bottom of these being fabricated. And this is the top. Um, so there, it's eight chips. Um, it's, you can barely see it on this slide, but uh, uh, 
the, uh, the flash controller and the flash memory are all right next to each other. Uh, and just to point out which is which, so here is the flash drive I had up earlier pointing out the flash controller, and then here's the monolithic chip uh, together. So that's the flash controller, and that's the flash memory. Now just to give you guys a better sense of scale, here's what the monolithic drive looks like in comparison to a regular USB drive. So you guys know how big a USB connector is, and that entire chassis is about the width of a USB connector. It's tiny. And this can, this can get even skinnier uh, to be absolutely like the size of a dime. But anyways, so uh, visual identification of these flash controllers. Um, if you're going to tear apart the housing, it destroys the device. Um, the consumer packaging never mentions what controllers on the inside, so it's, it's just a game of guesswork. Uh, the OEMs, like Kingston, uh, can use anything that they want. Uh, and the monolithic drives, I don't have, you know, nitric acid and a fume hood to, hood, hood to remove the epoxy from the drives. So we can't do visual inspection uh, for all of these drives. So what can we do software-wise? Well, the operating system sees what the flash controller wants it to, be it a uh, hard drive, CD-ROM, whatever. Uh, the USB product ID and vendor ID are supposed to be useful, but they're not. Uh, I've seen uh, an entire line of different sizes of thumb drives that had the same product ID and vendor ID. And a company doesn't have to use a, a different vendor ID or product ID for a different product if it's the same basic functionality. They can bring in a new controller chip, whatever. So we need to talk to the controller directly. Um, and there aren't any built-in OS tools to do this. Uh, so what software is out there to, to mess with these drives? Well, I happen to find one. Uh, written by some folks in China. Um, it's an application called ChipEasy. And this really is easy to identify all of your drives. Um, and because I know this is kind of hard to see, I'll give you a zoom in on it. Um, so it's got all the details you could ever need. It's got the drive letter, the capacity, the product ID, the vendor ID, serial number, etc. cetera. Um, and the nice thing about it is it shows you where the controller manufacturer, the controller type is, and then the coup de gras on this is it tells you where to download software to mess with these drives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I had a whole bunch of fission drives, so I decided to pick on them. So they're a Taiwan-based flash controller manufacturer. Uh, they make controllers for USB 1 through 3, SATA, IDE, EMMC, SD cards, etc. cetera. Um, basically, they have one common core that they can just bootstrap another interface on. Uh, all of these chips seem to be based, based on the Intel 8051. Uh, that is what's called an IP core, where it's such an old microcontroller that you can basically license the software schematic of this chip and then integrate it into a chip that you're designing. Um, some of Fission's controllers support crypto. Um, most of them support AES. I've seen some, some that support uh, RSA. And, uh, and all these drives support different modes. Uh, modes are how the drive actually interacts with the operating system as being a hard drive, a hidden drive, CD-ROM, etc. So a note on the crypto that's built into these drives. Um, so flash controllers do wear leveling because your flash memory can't stand being written and rewritten the same place over and over and over again. So it kind of scatters your data around. Um, the encryption key may be held within the ASIC, not on your flash memory. And this is probably done during the initial configuration of your thumb drive. And then you've got logical numbers, logical unit numbers that are logical drives that can be hidden or locked with a password and optionally encrypted. So uh, and another thing that's crazy is these flash drives have more space than you know. If you listen to Bunny's talk, every flash chip that is manufactured ultimately ends up in some consumer device. Everything is used. You fabricate a, an 8 gig chip and only 7 gigs of it is used. Well, OK, now that's, not, that's a 4 gig chip. So they actually clip down the regions of the flash memory that's actually still usable just to make it something that you're used to on the shelf at the store. You see quarter gig, half gig, one gig, two gig, four gig, etc. Even units of powers of two of your hard drives. So with all of these things together, it's a forensics nightmare. If you're trying to recover data from these things, you might have a four gig chip, I mean, I'm sorry, a four gig drive that's actually an eight gig, 16 gig, 32 gig chip that has more capacity that is just under what the next size up is. And the question is, how do you know it's there? How do you know it's password protected? How do you know it's not password protected? Et cetera. You don't, uh, unless you use some of these vendors' proprietary tools. And I'm actually still working on uh, re-implementing like how to ask the controller, what is your configuration? 
But uh, so these are the modes uh, that set up the, uh, the way the flash drive works. Uh, the ones that you're probably used to are the, uh, the uh, mode 3, that's your flash drive. Uh, mode 21 is basically the U3 drive, uh, where it emulates a CD-ROM drive and a hard drive. Um, and mode 7 and 8 are the cool ones, where you've got uh, hidden drives. Um, so uh, mode 21 is U3 equivalent, uh, so there aren't really U3 drives out on the market anymore, but you probably have a drive that supports this. You just need to find the software that does it. Um, the U3 drives are basically dead thanks to Microsoft and SanDisk because they superseded it with an application uh, called StartKey, which appears to be related to the Windows to Go software. So you can take your Windows install on a thumb drive and go anywhere and boot up your, uh, your office's PC. It doesn't matter what hardware you're be being plugged into. So here is the PS2251 block diagram. Uh, you've got the USB connection coming in from the computer to your USB PHY. You've got your USB controller, your flash data module, uh, some ROM, some RAM, um, and then the little orange block in the center, that's the microcontroller. That's this guy, the Intel 8051. This chip came out when I was born, 1980. Like pretty much every software out there that does reverse engineering of binary object code supports this chip, all right? So um, Bunny and Zobs at 30C3, they basically found out that SD cards have this MCU inside of it, and they completely got executable code running on that microcontroller, the controller that actually operates and manages the flash memory and talks to the computer. So um, most of their work will probably actually uh, port over to USB drives fairly standardly. Uh, all they have to do is just figure out what pins go where, and they can do the same thing. They actually wrote a debugger so they could figure out like what all the different registers, registers were in these uh, microcontrollers. Um, and the reason why is because this IP core, uh, you've got the schematic for it so you can, dis you can change it. You can make it from being an 8-bit controller to a sort of 8-bit plus a couple of 32-bit uh, operation chips. So once you've figured all this stuff out and you can mess with flash drives, what can you do with them? Well, I decided to come up with some hypothetical drives, um, repurposing the Micro Center $5 4 gig drive that I found. With some, make some Moose drives. And these aren't for sale, sorry, I don't have uh, enough to give around. Um, but so you can make a secret Moose drive. So features are, I've got a USB product ID and vendor ID of Leet Leet. I've got a 4 gig public partition uh, that has the Windows app to unlock the drive. And then somewhere between one and three gigs of space that has been recovered from this chip because it has additional space that is hidden and locked with a password. Uh, the Windows software says that uh, you can uh, try six guesses and on the sixth failed attempt, it'll erase the drive. Um, but I found out through reversing the actual protocol that goes across USB that no, it doesn't wipe the drive. Um, why implement something in silicon when you can implement it in software? So uh, I was actually like doing hundreds of thousands of password against, attempts against these drives under Linux and it still mounted just fine. So be careful, don't trust what all the software says because some cases it might actually work that way. Uh, you could also have like an entire portable operating system. So you guys have heard of the USB uh, drives that are the U3 drives that have uh, portable apps. Well, this is an entire portable operating system. So I put Fedora Live CD image on there uh, and it's got uh, another three gigs of space on it. So now I've got a persistent overlay of changes that I've made to this drive. Um, and push come to shove, um, I can erase that overlay and get back to a, a bare metal scratch image. Uh, and if you're a pen tester, like some people in the audience, uh, you can have a drive that has your Kali Linux or Backtrack or whatever, your favorite image on there, uh, and then additional one and a half gigs of storage. Now, because these are emulated CD-ROM drives on these drives, you can't write to this CD-ROM. It's read-only. But the remaining flash memory on it, you can wipe. So, for example, if you had a customer that said that I don't want you bringing in your own hardware, but they'll let you bring in flash drives, now you can bring your entire toolkit and if they're really paranoid about you exfilling data, which is kind of what they're paying you to do, um, you can say, okay, format this drive, and then I've got no data, done. So, which is for you? Um, you, can, uh, you can buy an ISO stick, which is a $100 uh, uh, project that someone made. Uh, it's based on an uh, Atmel processor, which is sort of the same thing that Arduinos are made with, uh, and they wrote a, uh, custom firmware for it, and uh, they wrote a bootloader called ISOCELL. So let you, that'll let you bring up a menu and select what ISO you want to boot 
on a computer when you plug it in. <laughs> Rob says sometimes. He's had problems with it. Uh, there's another project out there that's not quite finished yet called CDMU. This one actually has a four-line LCD that gives you a menu of what ISO you want to boot. Um, this one, it's basically in beta production status. Um, they haven't actually produced hardware that you can assemble yet. Or you can use a regular thumb drive that you happen to have laying around. Your out-of-pocket cost could be, could be between zero dollars or like going to the store and buying a couple. Um, and the only real cost is a little bit of your time plus varying levels of fun as you accidentally break thumb drives. So here's how you reprogram drives. So with Fission, um, they've got a couple different ways. There's an easy, foolproof way called mode converter. This is literally point, click, done. There's no like firmware that's uh, being rewritten, no executable code that's being re-downloaded to the drive. You're just reconfiguring its layout. Uh, the more advanced way is to use uh, their MPL app. Uh, MP stands for mass produce. So this lets you mass produce pretty much all of their uh, flash controllers and reconfigure them. That one comes with an app called Get Info. This will tell you all the details about how the drive is set up, what the block size is on the flash memory, what mode the drive is in, you know, that mode 3 for regular drives, mode 21 for U3-like drives. Um, and this is the application that lets you reconfigure everything on the drive. Upload new firmware, reconfigure the partitioning the way it's laid out, change the USB product ID, vendor ID, strings, etc. Um, and if the chip supports it, you can turn on crypto hardware crypto in the flash controller that will encrypt the flash memory. So here's Mode Converter. It's a really simple app. Like I said, it's literally point, click, done. Uh, you give it the number of partitions you want uh, and if you want it to be hidden or not. And here's the more complex MPL app. So this, they let you mass produce 16 drives at once. Uh, and I know this is kind of hard to read, but uh, these are all the different options you have. So this is actually the page where it sets up the partitioning of the drive, or the, whether you're going to have a virtual CD-ROM, uh, a hidden hard drive, a uh, removable hard drive. You can actually make these drives look like they're not removable media, make them look like they're actual hard drives. And here is Get Info. That shows you all the details of how it's set up. Um, and here's the Leet Leet product ID and vendor ID. So here are all the settings that can be set with that MPL app. You can change the size of the drive, change the way that the LED is blinking. Uh, you can make the uh, logical unit numbers read only or not. Uh, and uh, you can recover data from the, the regions of the chip that have been clipped in software because it was just below the next size up chip. Uh, all that stuff. So um, ultimately when you're using MPL, you're going to run into problems because it's not something that you're supposed to be using. It's not documented. You don't get like training on it. Um, but uh, so use chip easy, and I'll have a link for that later in the slide deck. Use that to identify what chip and what controller uh, are in the flash drive. Um, try the latest version of MPL uh, and be prepared to brick drives. Um, I probably bricked about seven of the 20 or 30 that I've bought already. It's just going to happen. Um, and a lot of times these uh, flash drives, uh, the controllers have firmware updates. Uh, and the reason they have firmware updates is because new memory comes out that these chips don't quite support. And uh, uh, you might have uh, more updates of the software like this ID block timing uh, thing. So that uh, associates the chip identification bytes to actually what the timing of uh, the flash memory is. You know, when you're tu tuning the memory on your gaming PC and it's CAS 11, 10, whatever, same sort of thing, but for flash memory and double and triple check that you've got all the flash ID and timing settings correct. So now it's time for a good idea, bad idea. <laughs> so I want to introduce you to uh, a piece of software uh, by Lime Technology called Unraid. So this is a Slackware-based uh, commercial network attached storage solution, um, and they've got different tiers of software that's based on how many hard drives you want to plug in to your, your box. Um, it's, it's between 3 and 24 drives, free is, uh, free is on the 3, uh, the three drive and below line, um, and the, the pro version where you have 24 drives is like 120 bucks. And they have a very interesting licensing method. They say, go find a flash drive, plug it in, and read off what this uh, GUID is. Well, the problem is, is this GUID, which is supposed to be global un globally unique, is not so globally unique. Um, here's their example GUID they have on their website. Um, and I can tell you that the, that GUID was from an Alcor flash drive because their GUID is literally just the USB vendor ID, product ID, and the serial number. So, 
here's how to clone a USB uh, license for Unraid. Download the USB software for managing these thumb drives, set the USB vendor ID and product ID match, set the serial number to match, and win. You now have cloned your license for Unraid. So, developers, please use a real hardware security token like an Aladdin Hasp, not some random thumb drive laying around. All right, so um, if you're looking for a hardware USB sniffer, uh, please see Dominic's talks tomorrow. Um, the reason why I need something like this is because there's no documentation on how to talk to these controllers. Um, and like I mentioned before, USB PCAP under Windows can kind of miss data. Um, and under Linux, there's no software that supports any of this stuff. Like the USB mode switch that you, you may have seen before when you're using your like 3G USB modems where it'll initially show up as a CD-ROM drive. Yeah, that doesn't work on these thumb drives at all. Um, so, uh, similar work in research, uh, Bunny and Zob's uh, talk at 30C3, um, where uh, they went over getting that direct code execution on the controller in the SD card. Uh, and uh, a lot of the photos I had on the monolithic drives, that was also done by Bunny. Uh, he went to an actual fab plant and saw where they were born. Uh, Wes McGrew, um, he actually took some uh, U3 drives and turned them into a uh, incident response. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's uh, next. Uh, he had a project on actually reconfiguring them. Uh, to make them uh, not have to use the software that came with it, that tr for some reason phoned home to their website to download an ISO image that had the U3 launch app. Anyways, um, so some additional things that's cool. Um, the password protection on some of these drives, you would expect it to actually pass the password or some encrypted version of that password down the wire to the drive to authenticate it. Well, there were some researchers that found out that, mm, no, the software just sends an unlock command, regardless of the password. And all they had to do was just repeat sending the unlock command, and suddenly there's all your data. Whoops. So, um, and Russ Buterini uh, also created an incident response uh, USB switchblade. So, uh, this is the slide you want to take pictures of if you're interested in messing with these drives. This is all the links to all the software you want. Uh, if you want to download Chip Easy, that is the app that'll tell you what the chip is for the controller and what flash memory is on your drive. And that will link you to upan.cc, which is unfortunately in Chinese. You'll have to run that through Google Translate. Uh, or you've got uh, other websites like flashboot.ru or usbdev.ru. Uh, or uh, an English language site is usbfix.blogspot.com. So, and again, my contact info, I'm Zabian on Twitter, Werewolf for GitHub, and there's my email address. And now I have time for questions. So the question was, uh, have I seen anyone doing any research on adding new modes to these drives? So like there is mode three for the regular flash drive, have I seen different modes for replicating what's going on there? Um, I haven't. Um, I've just found the software out there to reconfigure it, and I've re-implemented some of the features under Linux. Um, but that's an excellent idea. I mean, for, for people that are doing forensics, um, you're probably going to have to figure out what mode is this drive in so you can get a general idea of is this drive got, does it have hidden partitions or not? Um, and then you can go from there on uh, other things. But yeah, I don't have like x80, uh, uh, Intel 8051 uh, like assembly language done. <laughs> 